Hi everyone, welcome to our Discover What's Next series flight training and aviation session. We have a jam-packed session here for you with, with you tonight, so let's get straight into it. First and foremost, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today, and we respectfully acknowledge, uh, recognise elders past, present and future here at RMIT. Um, Moving along, getting into the session. So flight training and aviation, um, we, we're really prominent for at RMIT. And with that means we have a jam pack session for you. So we have three presenters, um, as, as sorry, four presenters, including myself. So my name is Daniel. I'm from the student recruitment team here at RMIT University. But we also have Paul Wyborn, so grade one flight instructor at a um, at our Point Cook campus. Paul is a senior instructor at flight training uh, based at Point Cook and has previously worked for an organization training pilots in an airline cadet training program and has been with RMIT since May 2018. And Paul will walk you through some of his background and hit the courses that he looks after as part of his presentation. We also have Dr. Nicholas Bardell, who has been involved with aviation throughout his entire working life. He trained as an air, aerospace engineer and has has divided his career equally between industry and academia. Industry appointments for Nick include Rolls-Royce, British Aerospace, GE Aviation and GKN Australia, where he was a technical lead involved with the stress analysis of many parts of the new F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. He's currently a senior lecturer in aviation and the undergraduate onshore program manager for this popular discipline. And our last presenter tonight is Harrison Skinner. So Harrison graduated secondary school in Bendigo at Catherine Macaulay College in 2018 and shortly thereafter began studying with RMIT flight training at our Bendigo campus. He's currently studying the associate degree in aviation and commencing what is the second and final year of his studies. So without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Paul who will walk us through the associate degree in aviation professional pilots. Thanks Paul. Thanks, uh, Daniel. Um, well, as Daniel said, uh, my name's Paul. Um, I've been with RMIT for just over two years now, and uh, the program which I teach at RMIT Uni is um, the flight instructor rating, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, later um, in this discussion. But to start off with, um, I'm going to talk to you about the associate degree, which is a, a two year uh, program. Um, and we get our students um, started uh, in the flight training component um, within two weeks, so uh, which is not very long um, to cover a little bit of theory before you actually get into an aircraft. It is full time study um, at either Point Cook or Bendigo um, campus and um, Harrison, um, if you'd like to share some of your experience um, with uh, how this timetable works. Certainly. So for us in Bendigo, we are five days a week. We are showing up in the morning, whether it be for a class or for flying. Uh, we brief on the weather for the day if we're flying. Uh, if we're heading into class, we go straight on in. Uh, there's one day a week where we head down to Melbourne for our theory class in the city. Uh, and there are several other online components of the course we do as well. But for the most part, it's uh, relatively a nine to five, five days a week, uh, extending onwards as the campus grows to seven days a week. Um, but yeah, we show up depending on what we're doing for theory or flying uh, five days a week. Thanks, Harrison. Um, so uh, we, uh, um, as I mentioned before, it's um, conducted out of either one of two training centres, uh, which is on the next slide, and that is at our uh, Point Cook base, which is in Melbourne, or um, our Bendigo base, obviously located in Bendigo. <clears throat> Point Cook, um, just a little bit about that. It's only 30 minutes from the Melbourne CBD, um, and we're operating out of the um, the oldest operating Air Force base in the world. It's where the um, where the RAF, the Royal Australian Air Force, was born. <clears throat> we're pretty much the only um, user here um, using this airspace. Um, at our Bendigo base, um, that's only uh, six kilometres from central Bendigo. And um, Harrison, can you uh, talk to us a little bit about um, what goes on in Bendigo? 
Yes, yeah, certainly. So for us in Bendigo, we're out at a former corporate jet hangar. It's an amazing facility, uh, beautifully clean and schmick. Uh, we fly uh, to a lot of uh, local and regional destinations around the Bendigo area. We were very, very lucky to be blessed with some amazing weather, uh, which helps us complete our flying courses unimpeded. Um, but yeah, the facilities in Bendigo are absolutely amazing, close to the city uh, and with access to uh, nearby cafes and, and the likes. Thanks, Harrison. Um, over on the next slide, um, I'll talk a little bit about the objectives of the program. Um, obviously, the um, it's not just hand and uh, hand and eye coordination, um, which we're teaching um, to operate uh, an aircraft safely, but primarily um, one of the key focuses is teaching um, uh, actual behaviours. So behaviours required in a professional aviation environment, and that's pretty important, certainly from a um, from employability uh, perspective. And by behaviours, what I'm talking about is the things like decision making, teamwork, critical thinking, threat and error management. Um, and building relationships in the cockpit, including communication with um, uh, with peers. So these are all um, key components um, to flight uh, training on top of the necessary um, skills required for navigation, um, etc. Uh, these all sit um, under the umbrella um, of, of safety. So, so obviously everything um, that we teach uh, has an underlying safety aspect to it. Um, in terms of the licenses on the next slide, uh, we um, out of the associate degree, you come out with uh, three different pilot licenses. Um, sorry, four different pilot licenses, starting off with the recreational pilot license. That's just the entry level pilot license. Um, Harrison, would you like to talk to us about the uh, what the private pilot license entails? Yes, yeah, certainly. So the recreational pilot license just allows you to fly in the vicinity of the aerodrome and the private allows you to go beyond basically anywhere, uh, which is currently what I'm doing at the moment. Uh, it's a pretty unrestricted license, allows you to fly a lot of different aeroplanes to a lot of different places. It's essentially the license that allows you to travel and, and, and go to different places as opposed to that entry, that first license, which is just sort of around the aerodrome, uh, that's more centred around handling of the aircraft as opposed to actually leaving and navigating. Yeah, that's um, that's pretty exciting. So that's the one that you can uh, you can put your mum and dad in the back and uh, and head off and go and have lunch somewhere. Um, following uh, following the private pilot license is the commercial pilot license, and that is um, that's the one that allows you to earn money. Um, so that's uh, once you you have that, you're you now become employable. Uh, sitting below that uh, is the ATPL, um, the Air Transport Pilot License, and then um, the uh, the associate degree has a fork in the road. This is in semester three. We'll talk about the structure in a bit. Um, so in semester three, um, students have a decision and they can take either one of those last two items, the, either the multi-engine command instrument rating or the flight instructor rating. It's that last one, which is the program which I teach. So I'm basically teaching um, um, people how to become instructors or how to teach. Uh, uh, on the next um, slide, the year 12 prerequisites are, um, well, you've got to be um, fairly good at math, so you need units um, three and four. Harrison, if you could um, perhaps shed a bit more light on that and perhaps the importance of it. Yeah, so mathematics is extremely important in, in what we do, as Paul said. Uh, the Unit 3 and 4 mathematics is the Year 12 uh, general mathematics uh, for VCE, uh, and that's a prerequisite. There's a specific study school that needs to be obtained uh, for the course. But yeah, that is the, the general math that covers a lot of the things you do uh, to some extent cover in the course, whether it be the theory classes or the actual flying part of uh, the program. Thank you. Um, and English is a, a fairly important component too. Um, English is a um, is a requirement to hold any pilot license anywhere in the world, and uh, you need to have uh, at least twenty in English, except um, English as an additional language, uh, which requires um, twenty five. Um, other requirements for local and international students on the next slide, um, you need to have what's called an a ARN or an aviation reference number. Um, that's issued as part of the whole process and um, 
you also need to have completed a medical examination. Now this is um, fairly important because uh, you need to be um, of, of fairly good um, health in terms of uh, ears and eyes. Um, Harrison, can you share some of um, some of your experience in terms of what that examination uh, um, entails? Yeah, certainly. So the, the medical required, as Paul said, is a, is a class one uh, medical certificate. A lot of people find it quite daunting and frightening. Uh, it was a pretty mundane and boring experience, to be <laughs> honest. Uh, it's a doctor visit uh, and a uh, eye specialist visit, and they just go over a few general things that you might come across in a general health checkup, uh, just to make sure you're all in good working order. As Paul said, ears and eyes are an important part, um, really just part of the process and, and nothing to uh, to stress over. Uh, it's a pretty easy process once you're up and going with it. Excellent, thank you. Um, there are uh, material fees involved and they um, include uh, books and uniforms. Um, perhaps Harrison, you could um, tell us a little bit more about what those material fees uh, involve. Yeah, so depending on where you are the, in the course, there's a few different things you need. Uh, things like maps, things like uh, theory, theory books, uh, things like uh, your uniform and whatnot. Uh, you get a lot of that at the beginning of the course. So a lot of those material fees you've got to pay are towards the beginning of the course and you get it out of the way early. And uh, there are a few other things that you pick up along the way, but just general things that you might expect to do in any university course, books and, and, and whatnot, uh, and things like the uniform, headset and, and the likes of. Excellent. Um, the in addition to that, uh, the in addition to the associate, uh, the, uh, the the material fees, um, there there could potentially be additional fees um, if there are additional remedial flying hours or um, or flight tests that need to be um, re reset. Um, now. Looking at the actual structure of the program, um, it's divided up into four semesters. So Harrison, I'll get you to talk talk to us about the first two semesters because I believe you've um, you're, you've already completed those, or you're coming to the end of the mm -hmm. second one. Yep. So uh, as was mentioned before, RPL is the first license you get in semester one, uh, which is a restrictive license. You can only fly within the vicinity of the aerodrome. Uh, there is also theory courses for that, and there is also a city theory course as well, which is not relevant to the flying. Uh, and beyond semester one, you move on to semester two, which is the PPL, the navigation flying, and the intro to CPL, which is, uh, as was mentioned before, the, the navigating uh, aspect of flying. Uh, there's more theory to go with that as well heading into the CPL. There is also another theory class in the city, uh, which is again, not relevant to the flying. Uh, and uh, you develop and begin to get uh, develop those skills for the CPL, the commercial flying, which comes in this third semester. Excellent. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, most of uh, these semesters are around 18 weeks long um, uh, and they cover a two year period. So semester three is at the start of um, year two uh, and semester four um, you can see there, which is uh, the, either one of the two ratings that is um, conducted in um, midway through um, the second year. Um, the uh, uh, Learning in terms of learning what you actually get, um, well, you get a um, uh, learning from a, a bunch of experienced um, ac academic and ground theory uh, instructors. Um, we have uh, those instructors based at Point Cook and Bendigo. Um, Harrison, would you like to let, uh, tell us about the theory and uh, the theory and flight instructors at Bendigo? Yeah, yeah, so we're really, really lucky to have some great instructors up in Bendigo. Uh, we've got a ground theory instructor, uh, Rick, who's a former airline pilot and at the moment flying with, in the photo there, Luke, uh, who instructs us in the air. So we've got an instructor for, for ground theory, the theory that we apply in exams, and we've also got another instructor who we actually fly with and teaches us the practical side of flying. And you'll see there um, Luke sitting with a student in Bendigo in one of the flight training simulators. Um, so we have a, a number of those. Um, there's one in uh, our city campus in Melbourne. There's one at Point Cook. Well, actually, there's a couple at Point Cook. And of course, that one you see there at Bendigo. Um, now, um, in terms of the um, career opportunities, um, Boeing put out um, numbers every year um, and pre-COVID um, the Boeing estimated that over 220,000 uh, new pilot jobs were going to be required in the next 20 years, which is quite 
quite a lot. That's only that's 220 just in the Asia Pacific region alone, um, over 600 globally. So the prospect, the, the career outlook um, is looking um, fairly good at, at the moment. Um, we're not quite sure what's uh, what's going to happen with the current COVID situation. Um, we haven't received, uh, Boeing haven't re-released any new numbers. So as far as we know, these numbers still stand. Um, there is going to be a high demand for pilots. And now, of course, it's a good time uh, once that um, uh, once the demand uh, in increases again. Um, we we forecast that the domestic demand is going to be the first to recover, followed by um, international. So, of course, you really want to be um, hitting the ground running and, and ready to um, you know be employable at the time when when that um, when the industry does recover in a couple of years time um, on um, on graduating um, a uh, associate degree student can look to um, uh, a number of different employment um, opportunities such as you can see on the left side of your screen um, flight instruction that's um, that's what I do um, obviously there's a range of other job opportunities and Harrison if you'd like to um, share what opportunities you're seeking or, or perhaps have thought about yeah, certainly. So for me, I'm very, very interested in the commercial aviation side of things, but it really isn't limited to that. Uh, no matter what time of the year it is or what's going on in the world, there are a vast majority or a vast variety of different opportunities in the aviation industry, whether that be charter flying, uh, emergency flying, uh, fire patrol and uh, charter flights in particular at the moment. So uh, commercial aviation is something that everyone looks into, but there's certainly a lot more out there. Thanks, Harrison. And um, uh, after accruing an, a, a lot of uh, additional hours, um, there are some more managerial um, uh, and senior um, um, opportunities uh, that you could see on the right hand side of your screen. Um, now, over on the next slide, um, you'll see that um, Qu uh, Qantas and RMIT um, have formed a partner partnership, and that's um, been the case for the last couple of years. What that means is uh, we are part of the Qantas Future Pilot Program, uh, which means we provide graduates um, to Qantas, provided they meet the eligibility criteria, um, and obviously they um, have uh, gone through all the uh, requisite assessment centres um, that Qantas put you through. So it's a, an excellent opportunity for RMIT students to become involved in a uh, in a mentoring program, which is basically what the QFPP is, um, and that um, it's it's free to um, to register, um, which is um, which again is an excellent opportunity for our students. Um, so why RMIT um, flight training? Well. Um, one great thing about um, RMIT is we own our, new, uh, our own fleet. Um, we are about to purchase a brand new fleet of aircraft, which should be arriving next year. Um, and um, Harrison, if you could perhaps just finish off for us um, and explain why you chose RMIT. Yes, certainly. So coming from Bendigo, it's a long way from Point Cook. Uh, before even the Bendigo facility was announced, uh, I'd chosen to attend RMIT. Having uh, known people from Bendigo, made the trek down that absolutely high quality standard of teaching and safety was very very important uh, and then once the Bendigo facility did open uh, the access to me as a regional person was was absolutely amazing so um, there was really a multitude of different reasons that led to the decision but the high quality of teaching and safety and the location in Bendigo really uh, really set it in for me. Excellent okay thanks um uh, Harrison and um, that we'll just finish off there with some contact details for um, RMIT flight training. Thanks everyone. Thanks so much Paul and Harrison and there are contact details on there. You'll also receive and I'll wrap it up at the end of the session um, this, uh, 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 once we complete but um, an email tomorrow so if you're after any more if you have any further questions um, you can reply to that and we will um, pass it on to the relevant uh, and find you the relevant information. Now I'm going to pass it over to Dr Nicholas Bardell who will walk us through the Bachelor of Applied Science in Aviation so please um, welcome. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, thank you, Paul and Harrison, for uh, a very comprehensive overview of the associate degree. Um, I'd like to talk to you now about the Bachelor of Applied Science in Aviation. Could we have the next slide, please, Daniel? Yeah. 
So aviation is a vast sector industry. It covers military, civil and general aviation and all the enabling infrastructure like airports and air traffic control. The largest sector, civil aviation, connects people, goods and countries and it's recognised to play a vital role in social and economic development. Last year, in 2019, commercial airlines logged more than 45 million flights and carried over four and a half billion passengers. That's over half the world's population. And this was made possible by some 5,000 airlines operating 25,000 civil aircraft over a global route network of several million kilometres. So, would you like to work in this vast and challenging industry? Next slide, please, Daniel. So, RMIT offers two bachelor programmes. These explore the complex world of aviation. On the right, uh, you will see uh, a course code BP070PL. This is our most popular program and it mixes aviation management with practical flying and piloting. We also offer BP070P6, shown on the left, which provides a more in-depth study of aviation management. Next slide, please, Daniel. Both programmes include contemporary areas of study as listed here. The management stream has 24 courses spread over three years. The piloting stream has 17 such courses, but these are supplemented by seven practical flying courses taken with RMIT flight training at Point Cook or at Bendigo. The piloting programme allows students to gain the recreational, private and commercial pilot license in addition to the bachelor degree itself. Next slide, please, Daniel. So why study aviation at RMIT? Well, RMIT has a rich history in aerospace and aviation complemented by a dedicated team of lecturers, most of whom have significant industrial experience. Our BP 070P6 management stream allows considerable flexibility through a total of six electives. So if you want to follow a particular theme, such as developing foreign language skills, for example, you can do so. Next slide, please, Daniel. As you might expect, we have a number of industry connections, which range from volunteer programs at Melbourne Airport to 12 week industry placements over the summer vacation. Most staff have current connections within the aviation industry and a variety of guest lectures are arranged to complement our formal studies. This is where an industry practitioner, such as a manager from Qantas, will join the class and provide an overview of his or her job to or discuss some other aspect of aviation that is a current hot topic of interest. Next slide, please, Daniel. There are plenty of opportunities for overseas travel and placements on our bachelor programme. We have established offshore partnerships with Singapore and Hong Kong. And we're currently able to offer five lucky second year students a three month stay in Hong Kong where they continue with their studies, but with our partner, not with us. We also have a good working relationship with Hainan Airlines. And last year, 
I took 10 of our undergraduate students on a study tour to China where we all learned how an international airport worked on a day to day basis. Uh, could you go back, please, to the previous slide? I haven't quite finished. <laughs> so the picture on the right of the two men and uh, Kerry Phillips, um, she's, she's now a poster girl for aviation. Um, this shows um, yeah, Kerry, who took part in an Airbus sponsored Fly Your Ideas competition. Now she joined a team with two aeronautical air engineers and her team actually made the finals in France. They were proposing a novel firefighting aircraft based on an Airbus A400M. And that's the big yellow aircraft you can see being held out there in the center of the picture. So um, as a result of being in the top five, they were actually flown to Toulouse, all expenses paid and hosted there by Airbus. All five groups presented their concept studies to Airbus senior managers. And um, to our absolute amazement, Kerry's team came second. That's second in the world. So all the universities in the world can join this competition. We came second. So um, they got a cash prize and they earned a lot of kudos for themselves and our MIT. Uh, next slide, please, Daniel. So what does a career in aviation look like? As I mentioned at the beginning, aviation is a vast sector discipline, so careers are possible in a wide range of different roles and businesses. We prepare our students to take on management or operational roles in uh, the first picture here shows travel agencies, which are absolutely vital for arranging and booking travel. Uh, next picture, please. Then, of course, we've got airlines like Qantas and Virgin, of course, if they survive the current pandemic. Fingers crossed they will. Next picture. Then we've got the whole sector of cargo operations, which involves moving time critical and perishable goods around the world. Next picture. Then we have ground services, such as managing the maintenance uh, and the servicing requirements for fleets. Uh, fuel management or catering management. I know we all think airline food sucks, but if you just think about the logistics of getting the right number of meals on the right aircraft at the right time, you can understand it involves a considerable amount of planning and preparation and project management. Um, then I see airports have just popped up there. Uh, of course, airports are the most essential interface between air and surface transportation. Um, takeoffs are free, but they do charge you landing fees. Um, and of course, you can't have one without the other. Then, of course, there's air traffic control. Now, for all of you young people, if you love playing video games, um, this will take you to the highest possible level of your skill and attention. And the aim is to make sure that none of those little dots on your radar screen ever collide. Next picture, please. There are also a number of bodies, um, both nationally and internationally, like ICAO, DASA or CASA. Uh, these organisations work to improve aviation safety uh, by means of regulation. And they're always looking for well qualified professionals who can join their ranks and help them develop the regulations as technology improves and also help them to monitor and um, regulate in that space. Uh, finally, of course, um, we've got the primes. So it's quite possible for our graduates, graduates to work for any of the primes like Boeing, or Airbus, 
uh, as well as acting as the customer interface between the airframe and the engine manufacturers and the airline itself. Now, I don't know if you're aware of this, but when an airline purchases an aircraft, uh, often there's an option of putting different engines on the aircraft. So uh, you might prefer Rolls-Royce engines, or you might prefer Pratt & Whitney, or you might prefer General Electric. And assuming the design will support that interchange, um, it, there, there's often some flexibility there. So there are some very, very interesting jobs uh, in that um, particular role where you're helping to uh, kit out an aircraft with the um, equipment that your airline uh, particularly wants. So in short, I believe there's something of interest to everyone in this exciting business. And next slide, please, Daniel. So the entry requirements are fairly straightforward and I believe quite achievable. Um, we're looking for a study score of at least 25 in any maths and English. Um, and as uh, Paul mentioned for the uh, associate degree, um, they look for a higher score in English if, if it's a foreign language. Um, so do we, uh, our rating goes up to 30. The ATARs, which um, most of you local students will be most interested in, uh, for our program, they are generally pitched around the mid 70s, uh, which I think should be quite achievable. Uh, next slide, please, Daniel. So if you're unable to join our bachelor program, perhaps you didn't get the study school or ATAR that you were hoping for, or perhaps you decide to take the associate degree first and then want to upskill in the bachelor level, um, we have an agreed pathway between the two programs. And if you finish your associate degree, um, we guarantee you a pathway into the bachelor program with 144 credit points or one and a half years of study. So um, generally uh, there is a way into all of these programs. Um, you just have to know what it is and how to access it. So this brings me to the end of my talk about the Bachelor of Applied Science in Aviation. I hope that's given you some helpful insights and inspired you to study with us here at RMIT. I shall look forward to welcoming some of you to our undergraduate programs next March. In the meantime, I wish you all every success with your studies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, that was a fantastic presentation from both yourself um, as well as Paul and Harrison. We now have quite a few questions which are coming through, but I'm going to first and foremost ask um, to um, ask a few to Harrison in the first instance. Um, so Harrison, if you can just quickly um, answer for me, why did you choose RMIT? Yeah, Daniel. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, before the Bendigo campus was even announced, I'd chosen to go to RMIT and uh, had been accepted. The, the reason being primarily because I have known of people from Bendigo who have gone down to Point Cook uh, and studied with RMIT at Point Cook uh, and flew, flew there and were very, very happy with it. Uh, progressed really, really, really well and, and highly recommended it. Uh, as I mentioned, also the quality of teaching and the level of safety applied uh, through the flying was uh, told me to be quite good. And that was a very, very important part of my decision making process. Uh, and then finally, uh, once they did announce the Bendigo campus, uh, again, at that point, already having decided to go to Point Cook, uh, just really, really did set it home for me that uh, it was a great opportunity to under, undertake the studies. Uh, and very, very, very convenient at that. So the, the quality of the education, the teaching and safety, uh, the good recommendations I'd heard, and then finally being in a regional centre like Bendigo. Brilliant. And um, what do you like most about flight training at RMIT? You sort of answered that just then, but I guess now that you're in the course. 
what do you like most? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, of course, the convenience of it uh, being at Bendigo, where I've grown up and where I live, is is really, really important. Um, I think for me, being a bit of an aviation nerd, the, the aircraft that we fly, the G1000, the glass flight deck aircraft, uh, they're absolutely amazing. We have a lot of fun with that. Um, and of course, the, the, the people that we're surrounded with in Bendigo, we're very, very lucky to have very, very dedicated, very, very friendly and supportive staff and instructors around us. And I think that's that's absolutely crucial when you're doing something as, uh, I guess, daunting and complex as undertaking a, a career in aviation, uh, flying aeroplanes, uh, to have that support around you, to have those people who, who really are passionate about it. And yeah, I, I think, you know, certainly the people that we have in Bendigo is, is absolutely amazing, just like in Point Cook. Brilliant. And my last pre-planned question is, what are you hoping to do after you complete your course? Yeah, um, I think, for, for me personally, I, I grew up around aviation in a commercial sense. So uh, the airlines and, and operating uh, larger aircraft is certainly the, the long term goal. Um, I think that the, the pathway to getting there, uh, it, it, you're never 100 percent sure on what that's going to be. So I, I'm very, very open and, and again, passionate about lots of different aspects of the industry, whether or not that's flying small aircraft as an instructor, looking for work as a charter pilot, whatever that might be. Uh, I'm happy to take that up in the meantime, but certainly my long term goal would be uh, airline flying and commercial operations. Brilliant. Thanks so much. So we have quite a few questions which have come through from the audience. So I'm going to get straight into it. Harrison, I'm going to stick with you while I'm speaking to you. Mm -hmm. How far into your course did you get the opportunity to fly a plane? Only uh, a matter of weeks. So the, the first lot you do effects of controls uh, doesn't come too long after you've done what is called a mass brief, that the theory brief for the flight. Uh, and it was really only a matter of weeks, two weeks maybe. Fantastic. Um, this one is from Anonymous. Now, I'm not sure on what these acronyms mean, but Nick and Paul, I might ask you if you could raise your hand, um, depending on what it is. Um, will the course include MCC slash JOC? Do either of you know what that one means? Paul, yep. I'll pass to Paul. Thank you. Uh, I believe uh, JOC. I don't know what that means. MCC. I believe is multi crew. Um, uh, and the answer to the multi crew question is no. If that indeed was the question. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I don't know what JO. Did you say JOC? JOC. Yeah. No, I'm not aware. No, that's of, of that is. Not a problem. We have one for you, Harrison, again. Sorry to pop you on the spot. What for, for people that uh, might not be able to get out there to um, Bendigo Open Day this year, what kind of facilities are out at Bendigo? Yeah, so out at Bendigo Airport, it's it's a bit of a greenfield site. Uh, as I said before, we're pretty close to the city and uh, nearby suburbs, which have got access to a lot of different facilities. As far as the airport itself goes, um, we're in a, a former corporate jet hangar, so uh, many, many years ago, uh, a company called MyJet flew out of there. Uh, so we've got a really, really amazing uh, hangar facility. It's it's very, very upscale, uh, not the kind of uh, environment you normally see at flight schools. It, it is quite, uh, very, very quite clean, neat and, and, and quite a nice space. Uh, we also operate uh, at an airport with QantasLink, so we've got air transport operations now and there's a, actually a cafe at the airport too. Um, we've also got uh, a number of other operators at the airport, but for us at our uh, our little hangar, uh, yeah, it's an amazing, amazing little facility that used to be a corporate jet uh, facility. So yeah, it's really, really nice what we get to go to each day. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Nick, I might um, ask you the next question. Um, we've had a question about the um, a student who's looking to go on to do a Master of Aviation. I'm wondering if you know much about the Master's program? Oh, you're on mute, Nick, sorry. <laughs> oh, you're on mute. That's better. <laughs> Only way they can shut me up, <laughs> you're on mute. Um, yes, sorry, um, we do. We have. We actually offer a master's program. Uh, the code is MC264. And it's essentially a two year program, uh, which follows on from the bachelor. But if you take our bachelor program, you can do the master's in one and a half years because you will get certain credit and um, forward standing. 
Brilliant. Thank you. Um, is there, I guess, a benefit to doing the master's program, Nick, while I have you? Uh, look, the benefit to a master's program, I think it just makes you stand out from the crowd. A lot of people nowadays have bachelor qualifications. The way higher education has opened up over the last 20 or 30 years means a lot of young people now have a bachelor's. So how do you differentiate yourself? How do you stand out from the crowd? And um, this is where most people now are thinking, maybe I should do a master's because that will give me um, new skills, further in-depth knowledge, and it will help me stand out from the crowd when it comes to getting a job. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Harrison, one more for you and potentially Paul. Um, is it, I might start with you, Harrison. Is it a problem if I've never flown a plane before and I'm looking to go into the associate degree? No, it certainly isn't a problem. Um, a lot of people do what's called a trial introductory flight through whoever that may be. In Bendigo, there's people who do offer that. I personally hadn't hadn't been up in a plane, a small aircraft like that before. So if you've not flown or not even been in an aircraft, uh, it's certainly not a problem, but it, it is definitely a good idea to go up in one uh, because it's not something everyone loves. Yeah. And Paul, do you have anything further to add? No, not, not at all. Uh, from a teaching perspective, it makes no difference whatsoever. The only thing, the only difference is, is that um, we don't get to see um, the uh, jubilation on the, uh, the student's face um, if it's not the first time they've been in an aircraft. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you. <clears throat> Next question, I'll start with you, Paul. Um, I guess, how has the current pandemic situation um, affected the course? I guess, is um, a student's learning from online and how does flight training operate in an online mode? Sure, that's a good question. Um, so, uh, in terms of the um, the theory, that's uh, we've we've moved that to remote learning. Um, the course itself is not an online course per se. It's not a uh, it's not a distance learning course. But because of the current um, situation, we have moved the theory the delivery of theory to remote learning. Obviously, we can't do that uh, when it comes to the flying component. So, um, uh, with very careful consideration and um, uh, and a lot of policy um, drawn up around how we go about um, conducting flying operations safely, we've managed to continue that side of the operation. Um, so we have a sanitization program um, uh, and uh, we wear um, we wear masks in the cockpit because you can't socially distance um, uh, within those close confines of a, uh, of a of a light aircraft. So to answer the question, it actually hasn't um, affected the, the program at all. Brilliant. And Nick, I might pass to you um, for your program. Yes, uh, we uh, went to online delivery in week three of this semester and we're just coming to the end of the semester and wrapping up all the results. Uh, semester two is also fully online. So yes, we've actually had to move a lot of our lecture materials online, uh, conduct uh, the lecture, the actual lectures online um, at a set time. Uh, and it's it, it's had mixed reviews. I think on the whole it's been successful. A lot of students have said it's great. I don't have to commute. I don't have to get up so early. I don't have to fight the traffic or the public transport. Um, but most have agreed that it does lack something. You, what you don't get online, of course, is the face to face in the lectures the opportunity to make friends and, and develop relationships with those around you and, and obviously to talk to your um, lecturers and teachers. But we are adapting uh, as um, good aviation people will adapt to a situation and making the best of it. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, our next question, I might keep it with you to begin with. Nick, and then we might go to Paul, is the major differences between the associate degree in aviation and then the Bachelor of Applied Science. So do you want to just touch on, I guess, what the program is like coming in as a bachelor student straight away? Uh, yes, so um, the, 
The, the two programmes are pitched at different levels um, according to the Australian qualification framework. Uh, so the associate degree is, is a level six, the bachelor programme is a level seven, uh, and this is reflected in the uh, slight difference in the entry requirements um, for both these programmes. Uh, Paul, do you want to add to that? Um, well, um, thanks, Nick. Uh, in terms of what you get out of um, each uh, each degree, the the, the professional pilot um, side of their bachelor program, you'll you'll get um, the recreational, private, and commercial pilot license. You don't get either one of the two ratings. Um, whereas the with the associate degree, um, you get to choose one of those. That's part of the associate degree. So you come out with either a flight instructor rating or a command instrument rating. That really comes down to choice as, in, in terms of what the individual um, wants to um, have at the end of it, uh, and that may the what may motivate that choice uh, could may well be a, a number of factors, including employability. So, it, yeah, it, it really um, it really depends. Yeah, I, I would generally re regard it in, in very general terms as follows. If you're if you're absolutely bursting to get up in the air and flying and you want to go on and pursue a flying career, the associate degree is is, is a very quick two year straightforward way to do that. If you're looking for um, perhaps a more managerial role, um, either with or without the piloting experience, um, then the bachelor programme uh, perhaps has more to recommend it in that sense, um, because um, what we find is a lot of pilots that go into piloting straight from school, um, later in their careers, if for any reason they're grounded for perhaps medical reasons or anything else, um, they find they're a little bit limited in what they can do without having a bachelor qualification. That is really understood to be uh, the bare minimum you need to move on into management type positions. So I hope that maybe clarifies the difference a little better. No, great answers. Thank you so much, both of you. Uh, next question is for Harrison. What does a normal day look like for an associate degree student um, in the professional pilot program? How many days a week are you allowed to fly? Um, that's, you know, what, yeah, tell us a little bit about your schedule. Yes, so um, it really depends where in the semester you are and how far along you are, um, what the day looks like. I guess, generally speaking, though, uh, for a theory day, uh, as was mentioned before, we're currently online, but normally we would arrive at the hangar uh, about nine o'clock or so, uh, and we'd have a, a day of theory with several classes with breaks in between, uh, and that would be the day theory. Uh, other days will be flying, so you might get there at whatever time your flight is scheduled, uh, whether it be in the afternoon, the morning, you arrive when the flight is. Uh, and depending on what you're doing, you brief what you need to. So it might be the weather, it might be what's going on with the aircraft, whatever lesson you're going to do, uh, where you're going to go, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then you go do the flight, you come back, you debrief, uh, and that's, you're done with your day. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, uh, you're either having a theory day or a flying day. Uh, both will start either in the, in the morning or for a flying day sometimes later on in the day. And you just basically show up and, and do what you need to do, um, depending on what you're doing for that particular flight or day. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Harrison. We've got quite a few questions coming through, um, so I am just going to keep on rolling them out. Sorry, guys. Um, I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer this one. Paul, uh, what airline do you consider best for new CPL holders? I'm not oh. sure what CPL stands for, but I'm there with you. <laughs> Um, thanks, Daniel. The commercial pilot license is what that stands for. Um, uh, and that's a, a really, it's a great question, um, but uh, I don't know, I don't really know how to answer it. Um, for, for a fresh CPL holder, um, the, um, there are a few employers that, that will look at, um, at freshies, if you like, you know, people with low experience and, and just a basic um, CPL. Um, the quantity, 
Qantas Future Pilot Program, whom we're partnered with, um, their minimum criteria is the is the next license level, which is the ATPL. So they won't accept you with just the um, CPL. Um, thankfully, that's part of um, what uh, the associate degree offers is the ATPL, which is basically a bunch of um, exams that you have to sit and pass. Um, uh, but it, there it used to be the case that you could go up north um, and um, approach um, uh, some of those tour operators or those fly uh, fly and fly out operators uh, with a fresh CPL um, and and potentially get a job. So there's certainly there, there are certainly opportunities out there. Um, and if I may just take a quick minute to um, answer the previous question about the MCC and JOC. I've, I've since found out what they are. So the multi crew com, um, com, multi crew coordination course that is in fact something that we have talked about. So at the moment it's not part of the associate degree, but it may that May, that um, position may change in future. It may um, be an additional um, course that we can offer. The JOC, which is the Jet Orientation course, that at the moment is not um, in discussion, so and certainly not part of the course. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Paul, and thanks for following up on that one. We have my team um, have shut off the Q and A, so you can't ask any further questions via it, just because we do have quite a few still to get through. Um, but there, Bear, rest assured we are answering all questions that come through. Uh, Nick, one for you. How relevant are the skills taught in the Applied Science Aviation Management degree to work as an air traffic controller? So, for example, are you seen as more employable or similar? Look, um, ultimately, you don't need a degree to be an air traffic controller. Um, they will do an awful lot of training, hands-on training applicable to uh, their particular uh, needs in an air traffic control environment. Um, but I would say our program offers you the skills that you would need to progress once you've got past basic air traffic control duties. So if you were keen to get into managing um, groups of air traffic controllers, um, basically climbing the corporate ladder a little bit, um, then the bachelor skills become really valuable. Um, but to just walk in off the street and become an air traffic controller, you can do that. Um, you might be surprised to learn that, but you can actually do that. Um, but obviously, if you can back it up with uh, a degree, um, that just says a lot more about you and your ability to learn, your ability to perform, and it will take you places in the future that perhaps you wouldn't go without it. Wonderful, thank you so much. We've had a question from Libby asking, do my vet study of aviation contribute to the entry of this universe of RMIT? Um, the answer is that you need to ensure this might, the vet program may put you in really good stead for when you come into the course, but you do still need to make sure that you're meeting prerequisites um, and ATAR requirements for entry, so as well as the additional requirements. So please feel free to have a look on the um, website at the programs we're discussing today, um, just for further information regarding entry requirements. Uh, Paul, I've got a question for you. Um, what's the main difference between going to RMIT to study flight training um, than going through the Royal Air Force, Australian Air Force for um, your pilot licence? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I think uh, with the Air Force, um, I don't believe you come out with a uh, degree. You do come out with um, no. with qualifications, uh, flying qualifications, but they are not in the civil sense. I, I don't, um, I believe it's a, a defence equivalent of a commercial pilot licence. Um, Nick might be able to help me on that. Um, yeah. So, uh, like, yeah, I mean, you don't come out with the, um, you know, the, the, uh, the same uh, knowledge and foundation skills um, as uh, you would do with a bachelor or, or an associate uh, degree. Um, um, but yeah, that, Nick, do you, are you able to shed any more light on that? Uh, yes, I can. Um, I mean, you're, you're really looking at very different um, opportunities. Uh, really, um, the associate degree and the bachelor, we're, we're, the main focus is really on civil, commercial aviation. 
Um, whereas if you go into the military, it's it's very different. It's a very different environment. Now, um, we actually work with the military um, because they're very keen to get young people straight from school uh, because it costs millions of dollars to train you up, especially if you're going into the fast jets. Uh, and of course, everyone wants to be Top Gun, Maverick, Hornet uh, pilots. Um, but if you do that and they train you up, they want to get the maximum possible number of years out of you in active service um, to recoup all the training money that they've put into you. So they're very keen to get you straight out of school. Now, of course, there will come a time when you're probably in your mid to late 30s when you're no longer able to fly those fast jets, at least perhaps not operationally. And uh, this is often a point in the career of the military where people think, oh, should I jump out and do something different now? And of course, if you don't have that bachelor's degree, your actual opportunities are quite limited. Uh, so we've even got a program where we actually offer to give um, Air Force and indeed Navy pilots uh, a certain number of credits and they can come on our program and take a reduced number of courses and get a Bachelor of Aviation, um, which is great. But I think ultimately you've got to decide what's best for you. What do you really want to do? If you're just keen to get up there and do the Top Gun thing, uh, all power to you. I, I quite understand where you're coming from. I would love to have done that. But um, if you're really planning strategically uh, longer term and you're looking to move into more senior management type roles, um, I suggest the associate or bachelor programs would perhaps be better suited to you. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. We're getting quite a few questions on fees. So I just wanted to make a quick call out and say that um, there was some advice from the government last week around fees um, to do with university programs. Um, fees will be finalised for the 21, uh, excuse me, 2021 entry into um, degrees as well as associate degrees, normally around August and September. So um, as sort of government advice comes through, we'll then update our web pages. So they're the best spot to refer to. Um, Harrison, I might pass it over to you. I know you sort of touched on this um, at the start. Um, how good at maths do you need to be to go into aviation from your point of view? Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Not You don't need to be any sort of genius by, by any means to actually operate the, the aircraft. Um, as part of the uh, first semester, you do a mathematics course which in and of itself is probably harder than any of the math you actually have to do when flying the aeroplane. Um, a lot of it's just simple addition and, and, and whatnot when you're actually flying. So the, the short answer is no, you certainly don't have to be uh, overly overly competent, but uh, meeting those requirements and having a good good grasp on math is certainly important, but yeah, yeah not not to the extent where um, someone who's not, as I said, an absolute genius at math is, is hindered in any way. Wonderful. Can, Thank you so much. Can, oh, yep. Can, go I, for can it. I amplify that for the um, bachelor? Wonderful. Can, can I just say as well that that's equally true for the bachelor program? It's, it's not engineering, it's not science, it, it is aviation management. So, again, you need basic math skills. You do get to do one maths course uh, on our program, but the maths is it's more incidental. It's not a mainstream focus. Um, if you've got some familiarity with Excel, Microsoft Excel, that would obviously be beneficial and basic statistics. But that's really it. We don't do calculus. We don't do any of the difficult stuff. We leave all of that to the engineers and the scientists. So. Yeah, it's not, it's not a maths heavy program at all. Thanks so much. We I've got time for two more questions, I think, just because we are at seven o'clock and we all want to get to dinner. So really, really quickly, um, just a question about um, class sizes and how many people go into first round, get sort of offers into your courses. Paul, I might start with you. How many traditionally in a sort of flight training class at Point Cook and um, how many people get admitted to the course in that uh, in a year? 
Sure. Um, we have uh, in like go back 10 years, we used to have classes of around 20. That was our sort of average intake. Um, these days they're up in the um, 60 to 80. Um, it's sort of really usually at the start of the year, it's it's a larger intake than than our mid year intake. So so we do have two intakes per year, one in February, one in uh, July. Um, at, we, we're not at as yet capping it, but but we will if we need to because um, for two reasons. Um, we're uh, primarily because we will never compromise on quality, um, and um, we you just simply can't offer the same quality um, if you have a, a, a extremely large class. Um, the other is simply resource. We um, we're, we're limited by the numbers we can fit in our in our lecture theatres, uh, which is I think it's somewhere around seventy to eighty. And yourself, Nick? Uh, look, the the bachelor program uh, it's grown in popularity incredibly over the last five years. Uh, as I said, the piloting uh, stream is the most popular, and we would get um, perhaps 80 students joining the program uh, every year on the bachelor stream, on the piloting stream. Um, on the management side of things, we're probably looking at about 35. So we're well over 100 um, as an annual intake. In addition to that, we've got collaboration agreements with a Chinese university. So we have about 50 Chinese students join us every year and the, the classes, certainly when we have mixed face to face classes, um, they were very multicultural and uh, immense fun. Uh, it's a very good melting pot of ideas and discussions. Wonderful. And my last question is, will there be solo flying as part of the course? So um, I might start with the associate degree, Paul. Um, solo flying and how far in until people are flying solo if they are yep um there absolutely is um solo um there is a solo component um there's something like 35 to 40 hours in the first um, semester um total that's the total flying of which um something around harrison might be able to confirm this for me it's around between 15 and 20 hours mm -hmm. of solo i think yep. something like that um you um an average student um should be um f flying their first solo uh, uh, in their 12th lesson, uh, 13th mm -hmm. lesson, mm -hmm. their 13th flight is actually a solo flight. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's quite conceivably um, a, um, achievable within, two, you know, two to three weeks. So, yes, it's um, it's a fairly short time span between um, getting in a plane for the first time and flying it by yourself for the first mm -hmm. time. Wonderful, and yourself in as part of the bachelor program, Nick. Oh, look, as part of the bachelor program, our students go down to Point Cook and um, Paul and his team uh, train them as well. So everything he said there applies equally to the bachelor students. It's just that we don't start the actual practical flying until the second semester of the second year. So basically you've got to get halfway through the program um, covering all the theory uh, and then you go off and do some flying. So um, other than uh, that, um, yeah, everything Paul has said is totally applicable to the bachelor students as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, that is it for tonight's session. Thank you so much to Dr. Nick Bardell, Paul Wyborn, Harrison Skinner, as well as um, the production crew in the background. So we had Michael and Tarika in the chat, as well as Christy helping out with production as well. So thank you all. It was a fantastic session. Um, in terms of, I guess, what's next, we do have, oop, we do have our open day. So this will be a virtual event this year, um, running on the 8th and 9th of August. So each of you will receive receive um, just for registering an email tomorrow with further information and to register for open day um, as well as a survey link so you can provide us with feedback on the session and you can re-watch the session as well. If you're interested in um, any more Discover What's Next sessions, there's a few more running over the next few weeks including in science and other areas so come along to those um, or you can contact study at RMIT if you have any sort of questions about prerequisites
prerequisites or pathways or anything like that, or reply to the email you receive tomorrow. But on behalf of RMIT, Flight Training and Aviation, thank you so much to everyone who's come along tonight. It was a fantastic session um, and we will see you again soon. Thank you so much. Bye.